coming tonight, and since this is such a small group, we can keep it relatively informal. I have a presentation and go through with some information. What I want to do is share a little bit of background about what Greater Wave 1 to 1 is, and sort of how we arrived at this point. Um, we'll talk a little bit about expectations for students, and then um, like some questions. I'll go through some anticipated questions that I thought parents and families might have. We'll talk about those things, and then you know, any questions that you have, I'll do my best to answer those as well. So that's the plan for tonight. Uh, before we start, I know some of you got introduced to, to these folks, but I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves. I'm Chris Clancy, I'm the Director of Instructional Technology for the School District. Uh, I'm Jay Altabella High School, uh, Junior Senior High School Principal. Melissa Stanek, Robert Street Principal. Jason Mitchell, Assistant School Principal. So, um, one of the first things I wanted to share with you or, or talk a little bit about is, you know, what is Greater One to One? What is the purpose of it? What is it? Really, on a simple level, hi, come on in, have a seat. Welcome. On a very simple level, uh, what Raider One to One in is is a program that is going to provide a uh, Chromebook to um, every student, and I'll talk about who those students are and what grade levels uh, later in the presentation. But you know, on a simple level, that's really what it's about. It's about providing that device to a student so every student has access to his or her own Chromebook to use. And the reason behind that is uh, really three main reasons. The first, and probably one of the most important, is to, to really provide some digital equity for our students. So we're a relatively large school district, and like most school districts you know, across the state, we, we really span the, the, the two months of uh, students that have and, and really don't have. And we have students in the district who have access to their own devices, and have access to multiple devices when it comes to home. We also do have students who have limited access or no access to devices. And this is an opportunity for us to level the playing field for, for all of our kids to make sure that they have full digital access to, to do what they to do. The second is really to try to, uh, I guess, break down the walls of the school and provide an opportunity for any time anywhere to learn. So in many ways, a lot of the learning that happens at school happens during the school day because of resources that are provided at school or because of access to, to teachers or other people. And one of the other things that we hope to do with Raider 1 to 1 is by providing devices that will go home with some students who are really allowing them to extend their learning um, at home and provide them the tools that they need to do that. And the third reason is that, you know, again, at kind of a simple level, we're treating the Chromebooks as a school supply, as a school material. We provide as a school district materials for all kinds of things, for athletics, for art, for music, for academics. This is really just an additional item added to that list. It's a very different kind of item, but we're looking at it as a, as a necessary school material. Just like you would need a uniform to play like, in a football game, you need a Chromebook to do your job as a student. So we looked at, we looked at that, uh, those three items. The second thing I'll talk with you a little bit about is what is a Chromebook. So in case you're not familiar with what the device is, uh, I'll show it to you. So this is the uh, actual the, the device that uh, we'll be providing to students, this model. It's a new device and a new Chromebook that um, is similar, not identical, but similar to Chromebooks that we have in the district right now that students have been using. So a Chromebook is um, really essentially a cost-effective laptop. They're um, on a scale of, you know, MacBook to lesser expensive laptops, this is really on the lower end. So it's cost effective, which is great for us because it means that we can provide more of them to students. One of the reasons that they're very uh, inexpensive is because there's really not much to them. The Chromebook only runs Google Chrome. It doesn't allow you to install any software like Microsoft Office or uh, Photoshop or any of those other software-based types of programs. So there are limitations to them, but they're also very simple to maintain and use because they really just run Google Chrome. Um, opening them up, it looks and functions just like our laptop. Battery life on them is also excellent. Um, it's about an eight-hour working uh, battery life. So if a student came into school and worked on this thing all day, every day, which I don't anticipate they're going to do, but if that ever happened, um, the battery would sustain them for them. Um, and then a sleeping life, it's, it's a few days. 
So the battery life is also excellent because it's not drawing a lot of power because there's not much to that. So this is the device that will be provided to students with a, a power supply. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about is really, like I said at the beginning, how did we get here? And, and what I wanted to share with you before I talk about the steps that we've taken is this was not a decision that was made last spring or this summer or even last year. This was a decision that was, has been in the works for several years and has been part of several different plans. So we really tried to do our homework moving toward this target date of September 2017 to provide these devices. So in 2013, um, Google Apps, which is the sort of the platform that runs Google Chromebooks, was introduced at Canastota. I didn't happen to be at Canastota at the time, but that's when uh, it was introduced to students. And it was used sporadically by different classrooms and different teachers who were interested in it. But it's been in the district for about four years, so it's not a new platform for us to use. In uh, 2014, the district purchased its first set of Chromebooks. And those Chromebooks were just on carts that kind of traveled around to different classrooms. Quite honestly, some of them went to teachers who used them a lot, and that's kind of where they sat, and that's where they were used a lot, and very frequently. So we've had different models of Chromebooks. We've tried different brands and different styles and, and, and at different costs for the last few years, trying to find the right fit, and we, we did end up settling on this model that was manufactured by Dell because uh, it seems to be the most rugged and, and the most durable for student use. In 2015, um, the district developed and the Board of Education adopted a, a, an instructional technology plan. And that was really a time where uh, learning and these devices kind of merged. And there was a lot of conversation around how those devices were going to be learned in support, or used, excuse me, in support of learning. Um, and since then, other things have happened that I'll talk a little bit about that have helped um, build a purpose for the Chromebooks, an instructional purpose for the Chromebooks with teachers and students. So 2016 and really actually 2015 as well, we've had several teachers um, at Robert Street and in the high school who have sort of served as our proofs of concept. So these were teachers who said, yeah, I'm interested in having Chromebooks in my classroom. Maybe I don't know a whole lot about them, but I'm interested in learning more about them and I want to integrate them and I want to make I want, to, I want to change the way that I'm teaching. I want to change the way that my students are learning. So we had some teachers at various grade levels who kind of took that leap and took that risk and said, I want to do it. And we were able to provide them with carts for their classrooms. So in those classrooms at Robert Street and in the high school, that the teachers and the students had access to a cart. So the cart sat in the classroom all day, and the students came in for a period. They got the Chromebook and used the Chromebook when necessary, and then in the elementary levels at Robert Street, uh, they had access to them throughout the day. So those kind of served as our, um, let's change the way kids learn, let's change the way that teachers teach, and those teachers kind of have taken that, that on for themselves for the last couple of years. And we really learned a lot through those classrooms about how kids learn with Google, how kids learn with Chromebooks, and how kids learn with inquiry and project-based learning. So a lot of the changes that happened in those classrooms weren't really because of the Chromebooks, it was really because teachers said, I, I feel like I want to do something different so that I'm meeting the needs of the students that I have. Um, so they adopted some different learning styles in addition to the devices that they had existed. And then this past year, because of all this work that we had been doing, we were able to start providing some teacher-led professional development. So as parents, you know that there are days during the school year that students are not at school for half days or for full days. And during those times, um, we're usually able to provide some professional development to teachers. Those are times where teachers can learn how to do new things. And um, this past year was great because we had teachers who actually came forward and said two things. Some teachers came forward and said, I want to learn more about Google Classroom, or I want to learn more about how these teachers are using Chromebooks in their classrooms, or how they're integrating project-based learning, or how they're doing what they're doing, because it works great. And we had other teachers who came forward and said, I'm, I'm comfortable enough with these things now that I'm ready to teach other people. I'm ready to share these things with my colleagues and teach them how I've done some of this stuff because I think it's worthwhile. I don't to know. So we put those two things together and we had a few opportunities this year where teachers provided that, that professional development and kind of learned from each other. So it kind of helps this kind of learning 
growing this year. We hope to do more of that this year. And that kind of has brought us to this point of this first phase of, of Raider 1 to 1 uh, today. So it's been a, a process for the last few years. One of the other things that we wanted to do in preparation for uh, Raider 1 to 1 is to try to learn a little bit more about access for students at home, so when they're not at school. So again, anticipating that we're going to provide devices to students, we wanted to, to see what it is that they did have access to and whether or not they would have internet access or have access to So this is a quick summary of what we learned. So we surveyed students in grades 7 through 12 this past year. Um, we got as many as we could. It was not every single 7 through 12 student. So this is not uh, perfectly exact data, but it's close. So what we learned from that survey was that about 92% of our students do have Wi-Fi excuse me, access at home. And I'll say that that number was higher than we anticipated, which is good, but at the same time, there was a, a place in the survey where students could share their information. And there were some students who said, well, you know, I said I have Wi-Fi access at home, but it's not always consistent. My connection might not be great all the time, or there are months where my parents simply can't pay for it, so we don't have that access all the time. But I have Wi-Fi access occasionally. But there are students who do have it was more students than we expected. So we asked them some questions about access to devices. And we said, you know, what is it when you leave? What is it that you have access to um, for home? Hi, welcome. So this is what we learned. Um, about three quarters or 78% of, of students that we surveyed said that they do have access to some other kind of device at home. And we gave them some options about what those devices are because uh, we wanted to know in terms of functionality Having a smartphone to, to do all of your work at home might be what they think is best, but may not be the best tool for them to do the work that we're asking them to do. Um, so we asked them some of those questions, and there was 16% of them said they only had a smartphone to do that work at home. And there are students who do write papers on Google on their phones, and according to teachers, most of them are actually decent papers, which is interesting, but that's uh, some information that we learned. Moving beyond just writing papers, though, and looking at other kinds of projects that students might have to do, I have to believe that that would be challenging to do on a smartphone. Six percent of our students uh, don't have any access once they leave school. They don't have any devices at home, smartphone, or any other kinds of devices. Then we said, okay, well, if you have devices at home, you know, is it your device? Is it a device that you share? And about a quarter of our students do have to share the device or the devices that are home. So if there are siblings or parents that all need that device at one time that can present a challenge when everybody has deadlines for the work that they have to do. Um, so there are, there's some sharing that goes on. The other thing we said, and this was just really for, our, for, for us to kind of know how we can support this, is, OK, well, if, you, if you don't have Wi-Fi access, or if your Wi-Fi isn't really great, or, well, what do you do in order to get that access? And this is a, a, a list that, that we provided to them, and then I, I ranked it based on their responses. So students said that if they don't have this Wi-Fi access, that they use a hotspot, which I'm assuming could be their phone or a jetpack or something. A lot of kids stay after you use the, the school's network, which is fine. Some go to a friend's house, some go to a public spot, and some go to a public library. So they're, they are trying to problem solve, which is good. Um, but it was also kind of good for us to know what it is that they want to be able to do so we can support some of those, some of those students as well. So some expectations that we have and, and some information about accountability. So we're providing devices to students, uh, obviously. And I'm very excited about doing that, but kids are kids. And what we have to try to balance is we're giving you a device, um, but you are accountable to that device. So we had to think carefully about how we could do that carefully without putting too much of a burden on families and students but also having some level of accountability so that, um, I guess, students take good care of these, these devices. So really, first and foremost, the, the Chromebook is really a, a school supply, like I said before. It's a material that we're providing to you, so it's really, its primary job is to help you do your job as a student. So it's intended to help write or do online projects or whatever it is that your teachers have asked you to do. or Really, maybe they haven't asked you to do it, but you're innovative and you have an idea and you have a way that you want to do 
whatever the assignment is, and you're going to use your Chromebook to do that. Um, our expectation is that they're going to bring the Chromebooks to school fully charged every day. That may not always happen, and we're going to provide some places where they can charge their devices, but we really have to have that expectation for them. With almost 200 Chromebooks going home every day, we don't have uh, enough places for, to, to charge 200 Chromebooks. So we're going to expect that they do that, but also understand that if they forget or if something happens that night and they can't charge it or whatever happens, we'll have some availability in the library. And classroom teachers have also shared that they'll within reason that will allow kids to charge if they need to do class. But first and foremost, we're expecting them to bring them to school charge. Um, so the device is theirs for the school year. We'll collect them back at the end of the school year for summer so that we can inventory them and do any maintenance that we need to. But really the device is theirs for up to four years. So for this first group of students, they, they won't have the device for four years. But when we start moving into other grade levels, uh, ninth grade, for example, the plan is to provide that device, that same device to the student for four years. We're hoping to get four years out of these devices. And one of the ways that we're hoping to do that, to maximize the amount of time that we have them, is to give the same device to the to student every year. So I get a device when I'm a freshman, I return it in June, and I get that same device back. So because I know I'm gonna get that same device back, Hopefully, I will take good care of it because it's mine for four years. Um, or if you would have um, So, one of the things that we, we really went, we thought a lot about was how are we going to make sure that we hold students accountable, but like I said, not really create a tremendous burden for, for families. And we kind of thought about some of our own kids. My kids are, are young, so they're not really at the age where they have their own devices yet, but other people who we talk to have kids that are old enough. And, and they said, well, you know, so I, I buy them a phone, and they break the screen, and I fix the screen, and then they break the screen, and I fix the screen. And at what point is there some accountability on the students, on the child's part, you know? And that's certainly a family decision. But we had to really think the same thing. If we cover the cost of any damage or breakage, the accountability on the students end minimizes and it's possible they won't take good things if you care. So there is going to be a cost associated with some of these damages. But what we said was we're going to minimize the cost. We're going to make the cost really as low as we can make it so that there is some accountability, but we're hopefully not going to create a tremendous burden for families. So the incremental damage uh, cost that we came up with start at five dollars. So if a student breaks a screen or um, damages a keyboard and the keyboard needs to be replaced, or there's some other repair that has to be done to the Chromebook that costs money, um, we're going to invoice the, the student or bill the student five dollars for that um, incident or that break. If the same thing happens again or another break happens, that cost increases to ten dollars. Third incident would be 15 and 20 for the fourth and um, So, by doing that, again, we're trying to help the student understand that there is some accountability to this device. So, even though we're providing it to you, um, we are holding them accountable to, to do the best to take care of it. The other thing that we thought about when we were coming up with these costs is really other things that are provided to students. So, if students are provided with um, an athletic uniform or a textbook, uh, and either of those things are lost or damaged, there's typically a cost incurred, and typically the district has to collect that funds, those funds back. So if a textbook or library book is in charge or something is damaged, there's a cost that is associated with, with fixing that or replacing those. So we kind of follow the same philosophy with that, but again, we just really minimize the cost uh, as much as we could. The entire replacement cost of uh, a Chromebook with licensing is just over $200. So if the Chromebook is lost, um, misplaced, or completely damaged beyond repair, so it can't be fixed or repaired, um, it's possible that there would be a maximum replacement cost of $215. The other thing I'll say about this is, you know, 
do not want this to be a burden for anyone, and everyone's experiences are certainly very different. So if there's a case where people cannot pay those costs or are unable to at the time, we, the district is going to be very flexible with people. We're going to do our best to, to meet people where they can do that. Um, while at the same time, making sure that those students are accountable to those, um, to those devices. So a few um, considerations or things that we thought about that might be questions that you have that I'll, that I'll talk a little bit about. And then uh, after that, if you have any questions, I'll kind of answer those. So first, you know, why, why grades 5, 11, and 12? Um, if you've read our technology plan, which I encourage you to do, it's a great reading on the website. Uh, the tech plan actually has some different grade levels. When we wrote it a couple years ago, we, we actually planned on starting at grades 4, 7, 10, and then second, we were doing 5, Grade levels. But that changed, and the reason it changed really goes back to those proofs of concept classrooms that I talked about when I was telling you how we arrived and where we went along. Um, these three grade levels, uh, grade, grade 5 and 11, primarily had lots of teachers who took that risk and wanted to, to do some things differently. So students have been experiencing that kind of learning, and teachers have kind of become accustomed to using Chromebooks at those grade levels. So for grade 5, um, we already had half the grade level doing that, that kind of learning and had access to Chromebooks. So it's kind of logical next step to, to finish that grade level. Grade 11, uh, most of the teachers at grade level, grade, grade 11, kind of same thing. They all had Chromebooks in their classrooms. Students were using them pretty regularly. It's a logical place for teachers to kind of take that next step with their students. And 12, we had some teachers who did have that access, but we also thought about the students and, and we said, well, if these juniors, these 11th graders who are now seniors, have consistently been using Chromebooks, I don't want to take that away from them as seniors. I don't want to say, we well, had all this access, and now, I'm sorry, that's not one of the grade levels we're starting with, so we don't have that access anymore. So from a student perspective, we thought it made sense to, to kind of maintain that for that group of kids. So that's how we arrived at those three grade levels um, for this fall, and our plan um, if all goes well, and this is budget dependent, is to, to really do this in three phases. And part of the reason for that is, is financial. So there's obviously a cost to purchase these devices, and then there's a cost to, to sustain them over time. Uh, there are districts that you could Google and read about that do mass purchases and do it like an entire building or an entire grade level at a time. And that's nice, that's just not how we decided to do it. We decided to do it this way and phase in the devices. So our hope is that next year we'll uh, provide the devices to these three grade levels. Um, six, because that group of students at five is going to be using them this year, so kind of like we said for that 11 like 12 group. And then nine and 10 would uh, provide access to the rest of the high school. And then we move to four, seven, eight. So that's our anticipated phased plan. So is 2018, 2019, five, six, nine, 11, 10, and 12? Yes. So we'll keep 5, 11, 12, and 6. Yes, thank you for that. Okay. Yes, correct. Yeah. So it's really three grade levels, six grade levels, nine grade levels. And then what's not up here, because it's a little bit different, but we're also, we have been providing access to students at Southside to Chromebooks. So they've started kind of using them in a few parts over there. Um, our hope is to, to get into Peter Burroughs and the teachers who want to do it. We just haven't uh, made that move yet. Um, but there is access at those buildings as well. And we're, Always provide more access to students, but yes, ultimately it'll be grades four through twelve. Um, students in grades four, five, six at Robert Street. Uh, the plan now is that those Chromebooks will stay at school. If parents and students and teachers are requesting that those go home, we can revisit that when, when the time is right. Um, but that's a possibility, and then same thing with, with our junior high. So. Um, will every student receive a Chromebook? Uh, the short answer is yes, and I know I, I try to put some of that information in the letter. One of the other things I did with the guidance council is look at student schedules, because we do have some students in the district who uh, maybe are only at Camp Soda for PE and then spend the rest of the day at OCS, you know, a OCS program. Um, we'll have students who are here for a, a, a course that they need to, to complete for graduation. And they have work starting for part of the day. So we said, you know, 
we're certainly going to provide devices to everybody who needs them, but there probably are students who don't. And uh, if it turns out that those students do need them, then they can have a conversation with, with their guidance counselor with me and do that. But we're really just providing them to students who are uh, in need of them, which comes out to about 180 problems that we'll be sending home with uh, about the 12th grade students. There are also other students who attend some of these programs that uh, receive laptops from that program that they receive. So if they get a laptop, the host just doesn't have a lot of to get a as well. Um, there's, what is the cost to receive a Chromebook? There is not a cost to receive a Chromebook. It's a, it's a again, we're treating it like a school supply that we're providing to you. And the cost that could be incurred is if there is uh, damage to um, This question I've actually fielded a couple times already. So what if a student doesn't want to distribute Chromebooks? So, uh, maybe a student has, has their own Chromebook or some other device that they love to use more. Um, they, just, they don't want this Chromebook. And because this is our first year, the decision that we made is that we're going to provide a device to everybody that, that needs a device, regardless of whether or not they have a device that they want to use instead of a personal device. And there's really two reasons for that. The first is that we can manage the district Chromebooks that we provide. So if we're providing a device to uh, students, we really have to guarantee that that device is going to work, that it is filtered for web content, just like it is when we're in school, um, and that it's going to function. And we can guarantee that with the Chromebooks that we're providing. We can't necessarily guarantee that with personal devices. So, that's one reason that we're going to provide it. And the second reason is, is that if there is damage or if something happens to one of the district Chromebooks that we provide to kids, they can give it back to us and we can replace them. If they have a personal device and something happens with it, it burns and stops working, and somebody else needs it for the day. I don't want to be in a position where a student says, well, I don't have access today. What do I do? And for those two reasons, we're going to provide devices. I, I, I understand that there may be some situations where uh, Chromebooks go home and maybe aren't used a lot because the student is using his or her personal device. And that's just something that we're going to have to revisit in the spring. And if we need to do it differently next year, we can do that. But because it's our first year, we really don't know how it's all going to play out. That's the way that we're going to, uh, we're going to move forward with, with that. So if a student doesn't want one, we're still going to provide one. And if that's really an issue for a family or a student, uh, I'm always happy to have a conversation about that. What if a student doesn't have Wi-Fi at home? So I've talked a little bit about you know, students that do or don't. Um, so a few things about, about Google. Um, even though the Chromebook does rely on a Wi-Fi connection to do a lot of what it needs to do, there is a, an offline function. So for some of the Google apps, Google Docs, which is the word processing, Microsoft Word equivalent in Google, uh, Google Slides, which is the PowerPoint equivalent, and Google Sheets, which is the Excel equivalent. Those three items can be used offline, so they can be used without an internet connection. So a student can go home, finish an essay, or type a paper offline, and then when they're back at school and back online, it'll sync back to their account to be seen that it needs to be done. So there is some offline access available. Um, the other thing that we're doing this year is we've uh, made an investment in two uh, jetpacks through Verizon. So like a MiFi kind of thing or a, a hotspot if you're familiar with those. So the district already has a Verizon account for some cell phones in the district. And uh, we contacted Verizon and said, you know, this is the situation where we want to provide internet access to kids that might not have that for projects for short term. And they provided some information to us, and uh, fortunately we're able to get two, which isn't a lot, but we're going to have two uh, jetpacks that can be signed out with a Chromebook, so it'll have to be a separate Chromebook. There will be a kind of a combination that can go home. And that would really be used in a situation where uh, a student has a project that requires online access, and they just don't have another way to get it done. So it could be signed out for the, for the term of that project. Um, and again, because we don't know how it's going to kind of play out, we started with two, 
and we'll see how it goes, and then we'll decide what we want to do next year. That's one of the things that we're trying to do to, to uh, address that. So this question came up, what if a student does not want to bring his group home? So uh, it's very possible that we'll have kids who won't want to bring them home because uh, they're afraid to, or because uh, potential issues that they're anticipating at their house, or uh, other devices that we have at our house get broken all the time because this person does this. So whatever the situation is, we wanted to address that. So we set up a, a cart in the high school library, and the sister boy has kind of agreed to oversee that. So we do have a place for students who uh, can't or really don't want to bring those devices home at night. Overnight storage and charging. So I'm not making that really public with students because it's not supposed to be like a, I don't want to bring it home, so I'm going to throw it in the library for the night. It's really supposed to be for those special cases where they can't. Um, or maybe where we determine, you know, you bring it home and you've broken the screen five times. We're going to keep it here for the next month at night because we've really maxed out your screen. So we will have that available in the library. Um, I want to stop now and take some time to answer your questions that you might have or anything you need clarification on, or comments, or thoughts, or suggestions. Um, I'll go to the following. I saw a letter that you recommend the process. Yeah. Because I, those are still for time. So. Yeah, yeah we, we made the decision to buy more devices than to provide devices. One of the reasons we went with this particular model is because it does have a rubberized edge. So, which will protect it. It'll protect it from bumps and sun drops. Um, and you, the policy still is they cannot carry backpacks to, to transport these from this class. Yeah, we don't like that rule. That's not true. Yeah. That's I mean, no longer true. Oh, oh, so they can now have backpacks in school? Uh, it's one of those things. It, it's a hot topic. Backpacks are a hot topic for a whole bunch of different reasons. Primarily, reasons for safety yeah. reasons. Um, not only because what well, you can put in the backpack, but what you can, the backpacks, you know, if you, if you put them on the floor, teachers will walk around the room, teachers have tripped over backpacks. So, because of what they can be put in the backpacks after, you know, a lot of some school violence issues, and then some of those, many schools said, you know, more backpacks. So, this became a big issue for us last year. Where we had, we had this rule that nobody had back you know no backpacks, but um, uh, make a long story short, we recognized that we needed to kind of address that and take a little look at that. So uh, as far as the adults in the building were concerned, we, you know we talked a lot about that, did, a, did an adult survey about how we felt about it, and make a long story short, we are going to uh, look to allow backpacks. But he had said something earlier about like not broadcasting that. I do not want to broadcast that because of it is a kind of a, a touchy subject, you know, with, with a lot of different people depending upon who you talk to. So we're going to kind of just let it roll and, and kids will figure it out, you know, there are going to be backpacks everywhere within a, within a week or two. Um, it's just a bad for them when they're walking, when they yeah. can't go to their classroom. Yeah, you know, it, class, they have it's to one of the most important They're yeah. carrying stuff like this trying to get back and forth. Totally. These cases, oh, are, they start at eight bucks on Amazon. Yeah, um, I'm so. sure. Yeah. But yeah. I guess so. It's so a like a soft side case. Yep. So I can I can show you on our website. What I do is I um, put some information about that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so on the district um, website under departments and instructional technology, there's a reader one to one. Page, and I tried to put some information about the program. There's a link to the handbook, the agreement that was mailed home, um, some FAQs. Some of them I talked about tonight, but there might be some others on there that you want to take a look at. And I, I made a page for the combo cases. So on this page, I have the model number and um, just a little bit of information about really the three categories of cases. So there's a shell case, which is like, it's like a shell, it just wraps around the thing and really all that protects from is scratches which if it drops yeah, it's it's, not really yes, dropping yeah. is, the, is the concern um, 
a sleeve is uh, probably the, the least expensive, but probably one of the better investments. A sleeve is like a zipped case that the you public just slides it. into. Yeah, so that'll protect it from you know, being in a book bag potentially with other books or other items that could put some pressure on it. And then a rugged case or a portfolio, portfolios like, uh, can be like a soft case that has handles on it, but it stays on, so they open the thing and it stays right on the, the on the Chromebook. They're the most expensive. It's really, I guess you have to know your, your Child or children, and uh, think about the investment you want to make. I mean, I guess if I had to make a recommendation, is the sleeve not that expensive? It's probably really going to do the job because it's really the traveling back and forth that could be an issue. Yeah. So. Is there, we are over okay, but I know that there are several people that won't be able to buy the cases that probably need them. Is there a way that these kids can do some fundraising to come up with the money to provide for those cases? It's a good idea. I mean, to, to have, I mean even with the, the breaking up, have the kids be working that off, not just, hey, hey, mom, give me 20 bucks. I broke it for the fifth time. Have them to be more accountable. Have them do some kind of community thing in the school, have to to pay I don't even know how to make work dances or do something to try to get these kids more accountable for. There's a lot of, that's a great idea you know, in, in some respects. Um, there's a lot of rules behind what you can have a kid do in the building. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if a kid graffiti's on the bathroom wall, technically I can't allow him or her to grab the chemicals to wash the, that stuff off the wall, but that would make sense because the punishment is that crime, right? right? But there's a lot of rules against that, so like, um, it, it's not as cut and dry yeah. as, as that may seem, I guess. Um, yeah, and I don't even know what things I could do. Yeah. I just, as we were going over the, the price, it doesn't bother me about yeah. the price because it's a great, great prices. But I'm thinking these kids are just going to go to mom and dad and say, yeah. You had mentioned if um, that the students would be accountable if there's accidental or intentional damage. But what about things like? The types of things that happen in my house is, you know, just normal wear and tear. That charging cord doesn't charge anymore, um, or through no fault of your own, your I mean, this one, but, you know, your screen is now black and you, you can't get back anymore. You know, the kind of things that, or or your battery won't hold the charge anymore. Are those things, you know, the student pays for that? So those would be things that would most likely be covered under our warranty okay. for the that device. Just like if you purchase something personally and something dies, um, no, they wouldn't be accountable for that. Is that a warranty? Well, there's, there's really a one-year warranty on these devices. Um, but as far as what the school would cover and what, you know, what we would hold students accountable for, it's really if, if it's damage that was preventable that happened they're accountable to that, to that damage. So there is a one-year warranty that basically the school is kind of being covered under? Which only covers defects that you described. It does not cover like a screen grade okay. or other things like that. It covers the screen died after the first month or the battery doesn't have to charge. Those kinds of manufacturer defects. The damage, no. So with a student who damages it and say, you know, they're paying their five dollars, but it's costing the school, you know, hundred five dollars. Where is that money coming from? Uh, the budget? I've yeah, I've I've had to keep some money in my budget anticipating that I'm gonna have to spend some of it in order to cover this. But that was a decision that we made because the alternative was, you know, if we charge full price for a screen, they can range from thirty to forty dollars. You know, so one time could be very difficult for a family to, to pay for. And we we didn't want to be in a position where families were coming to us saying, "I'm not even going to be able to pay for one screen. My kid breaks his phone screen three times a year. He's going to break the screen. I know it. I don't want the device. I can't even think about it. I don't want to make the decision between." You know, school supplies are food and a, and a Chromebook screen. So 
we made the decision as a district to kind of eat some of that cost for the first year. Now we'll reevaluate in the spring and, and most likely make some changes next year, but that's a decision that we made that we were going to eat some of that cost. But can I just piggyback that a little bit? Sure. Or recognize the need for some sort of accountability. Right. Oh, I agree. That, I'm that just wondering yeah. where it would be coming from. Yeah. Oh, I, I was thinking like that. Yeah. Warranty? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I was. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I'm not all that familiar with the Google applications, so you were mentioning like the students could work on them offline, you know, when they come to school, it basically updates. Yeah. What happens if like the battery dies in that period? Is that information lost? So if they're working offline, right. it's stored on the device. So up okay. to the point where the battery died, maybe minus a few words. Okay. It's constantly the same. Yeah. Yeah, they're online and something happens. It, it saves up to the That's I thought it was already using Good. Yeah, and that, you know, kids are good. Always safe. You just remember to save. Right. Right. <laughs> Right, well this generation doesn't, you know, I was in college and you know, we grew up with the same button all the time. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Clancy, but I, you know, I think it's important to remember that these, these aren't like full-fledged laptops. You're not going to be able to do, you know, the kids aren't going to be able to gaming on these things. They're not going to be able to do, you know, these are almost like word processors. They, they have access to the internet, access to the, to the Google suite, which is what allows us to submit, you know, documents and submit, you know, assignments and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like a full-fledged laptop and, you know, they could use for all sorts of different stuff. It's more school-based. Yeah. You know, and for, for school assignments and, and things like that. And one of the things I mentioned um, that I'll expand kind of your hand is up and answer your question, but um, we made an investment in a web filter. So we have to have a web filter at school. A web filter basically takes all the internet traffic, checks it, makes sure it's okay, and then lets kids see what they can see, simplifying it. So the web filter that we use is going to filter uh, content at home as well because we have to be able to say, if we're going to send this device home, we're not going to send a device home with kids that's going to allow them to go to places that you don't want them to go on the device. So um, when they're off site and online, it does filter the content just like it does at school. It doesn't change if it follows them wherever they go. So that would be interesting. Do you have a question? Um, are, is YouTube going to be locked on these? So right now it is. But I will tell you there are lots of teachers who are interested in having it unblocked, and I support that. Um, but like many other things at school, that's going to be a process that we're just going to kind of work through this fall to get everybody on the same page. You can put filters on that too, can't you? What's that? You can put filters on that too, can't you? Within YouTube? Yeah. You can. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been requested for a couple of years by, by teachers because there's a lot of content they want to push out to kids to get them at school. So, we're, we're going to work on that one this fall. Yeah, good question. Okay, I have a question about if there was someone bullying and they're getting to a fist fight and then it breaks, whose fault would that be? If like someone just pushed someone else, like person A is the bully, person B is the victim, and person B has the phone book uh, on them and it falls and breaks, would person A get in trouble for that, or would the person B? Well, we probably have to do an investigation. Mr. Alcadell and Mr. Kahn do an investigation just like they do minus the Chromebook mm -hmm. to determine what happened, why it happened, you know, and, and come up with some kind of consequence. Um, there would be, just like there would be for anything else, there would be some accountability for somebody for, for the damage to the device. That's a hard one. Yeah, it's, you know, it's just the, the reality is that's going to be a very, very hard at times. You know, yes, we have cameras and stuff, and if we can prove, you know, that there was damage caused by one individual and not the other, then it, obviously that, you know, that makes it easy. That's not always the case, and that's when people feel like things are unfair. Because if we can't, if we can't determine proof, 
then it becomes a he said, she said thing, and we can't get into that. Like, we, you know, whether I think, yeah, you're right, whether I think that, I, I can't go by that because that wouldn't be fair to that other person. Because what, you know what I mean? Like, if they're saying the same thing, that's that, that is very difficult. But if we can prove it, then we'll, we'll actually report it. Hence the protective case. <laughs> if you can. If you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there going to be any kind of like a requirement with the kids to take notes on the Chromebook versus handwriting notes? That's really a, a teacher's decision. I'll tell you that uh, in June, all of the uh, 11th and 12th grade teachers, teachers who had students in those grade levels, and other people who work with kids at those grade levels in the building, our teachers, and the teachers, and the librarian, got together in the library and talked about that. And one of the questions I said was, one of the questions that I get from parents is, you're going to give kids devices. Well, does that mean that everything that happens is going to be online and they're going to have assignments on them every night? And, and all of those teachers said, no, that's not the case. It's really not, it's not necessarily going to change from, from last year to this year. But it's really a teacher's discretion. If a teacher makes the decision that this is how I'm going to ask you to take notes or this is how I'm going to provide notes to you, then that's possible, I suppose. But that's really a teacher's decision, just like they can decide if they want to give kids notes on paper if they want them to take them in a notebook or whatever the decision is. So probably a good question to ask uh, the 11th and 12th grade teachers during open house. But and I would say, you know, if, if the student feels like he or she uh, learns, you know, better for, for, you know, from handwritten notes because they feel they can put their own little spin on them, I have that conversation with the teacher too. Just, right. you know, just to work that out. You know, the teacher might want to see it in this format, but the kid said, well, hey, you know, I, I really like to do it this way, and here's why. I would encourage any kid to have that conversation with you. Right. And it, like, remove their Chromebook from, this, from the equation, I guess. And if the situation is different, the teacher said, this is how I want you to take notes, and the student can't or it didn't work for them, I hope the student will talk to the teacher again. So I would treat it really the same way. Um, I would say that I hire people, what, a two-year degree? That's the minimum to work where I work. And it's an expectation that you can use your keyboard and your assignments are done on a computer, something called program. And if you do something wrong, the first thing you're told is redo this module. So if we don't give this to our kids, they're going to be in trouble. Anyway, all the employers are checking. Every, yeah, so that's, um, you may know this more better than I do. I think one of the greatest, um, the, the greatest growing workforce area are for people with two-year degrees and who, can ha who have some sort of technological uh, background to solve problems. So it's not like, like manufacturing, for example, it's not necessarily the manufacturing that, that, that um, is the work, it's the how you fix the machine to do the manufacturing, how do you solve that problem, that particular machine. So, so that, you know, working with some of the BOCES, I've, I've, we've had a lot of those discussions on how to get students more access to these types of things um, so that they learn the programs that are on them so they have more experience with the digital component, the te technological component, and then they can apply that to future jobs. So I think that's the direction that we're trying to go, you know, be like a 21st century reality. school, and it's reality, right? I mean, we all know, we go to a meeting, everybody's got a cell phone out. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, we want, you know, we want them to put them away, but that's not the way things work anymore. You know, I mean, even kids come, kids come to classrooms with cell phones, and, and, you know, and there's a big, there's a huge belief that, you know, that some people believe that cell phones should be non-existent in schools, and there's the other side that's like, well, that's kind of, that's a losing battle, so let's embrace it, let's, instead, of, instead of fighting it, let's figure out how to use them as learning tools, number one, but number two, and probably more importantly, what's appropriate use of the cell phone or an appropriate use of the device? It really does give them the opportunity to Look at the information. How do you use it as a tool? Is out there, right. And if kids are using it in the correct way. Right. And, and again, not that it's easy to monitor that, yeah. but. And it's a double edged sword because yeah. you could, we could argue the complete opposite here, sitting here too. Right? You know, so it, it's it's tough, and you know, so it's a mindset change, and it's a, you know, looking at it from a different angle. Do these Chromebooks have recording abilities on them for the kids who? I'm just thinking for my son in the future who might struggle with the notes. 
Like audio? Yeah, because I have yeah. the option yeah. of the way so to just record the notes as they record the slides. There's some different options for that, yeah, that can be recorded, you know, as far as how that's going to happen. Um, I don't know if we have a policy about that, but if a student is interested in recording a class, they can something they should discuss with the teacher first. Um, I think he's going to have to activate on the Chromebook too, correct? Or can they do it? Does it do it automatically? This is one of the things with the IEPs that do struggle to that extra. Yeah, certainly want to support, but you know we have to just yeah. make sure everybody's aware that things are being recorded. That's right. Exactly. But there's also an audio, there's a, a speech to text function in, in uh, Docs that will allow them to speak and it types the text for them, like you would do with Siri on your phone. Well. So that's those are helpful. Maybe you already talked about this before I got here, but the wait button. Is there, um, what about kids who are going to BOCES and are getting a BOCES computer or a BOCES laptop? So we don't plan on getting them a Chromebook okay. uh, because they get a laptop. Okay. So, yeah. Um, for 10th grade students who are taking 11th grade classes who need the Chromebooks for their classes, would they be able to get one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we thought you were. It's true. Yeah. 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 My friend is taking 11th grade English and she's in 10th grade. And I never about it. So, thank you for your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would like to yes, get in touch with uh, Mr. Magusi, who I think is the 10th grade uh, guidance counselor. and. So I don't want anybody to feel like they're not going to have access. So we'll, we'll figure that one out. I just I need to get that list from Mr. Magusi and figure out how we want to handle that. So thank you. 